Okay, uh, good evening everyone and welcome to the first in a series of conversations with the community regarding public safety. My name is Ken Hyatt and I'm the city manager for the city of Woodland and while we had hoped to be able to conduct this initial conversation in person, we felt um, in the interest and the concern around this topic, it would be best to proceed uh, within the parameters of the current health guidance to be able to initiate this important dialogue with the community. Tonight's virtual public meeting is mostly about listening to the community and responding to your questions about uh, the Woodland Police Department policies. Uh, Police Chief Derek Kaff has prepared a comprehensive presentation that provides insight into the department's policies, practices, and procedures that have been the subject of much interest in light of the unthinkable acts that have occurred in our country. After the presentation section of the meeting, Chief Kaff and several of his staff will be available to address questions from the community. Uh, I want to thank those who have taken the time already to submit questions uh, to us uh, for this conversation. And for anybody uh, participating in the meeting this evening, there are several ways that you can go about submitting those questions during the course uh, of the presentation and uh, during the conversation. Uh, real quick, uh, those three ways include if you're participating by Zoom, uh, as shown here on the screen, uh, you can use the chat function and submit your question through the chat function. Uh, if you're participating via Zoom uh, on the phone, you can uh, dial uh, star nine and uh, indicate your interest to uh, submit a question via Zoom that way. Additionally, uh, if you're watching on uh, channel 20 or 21, you may uh, submit a voicemail message uh, to 530-661-7920. All voicemail messages received by 6 p.m. will be played during the community safety conversation event at the appropriate time. Questions received after 6 p.m. will be played if possible. Uh, and if not, uh, those questions will be retained for the next community safety conversation or responded to um, otherwise beforehand. And then lastly, uh, you can submit questions and comments to community safety questions at cityofwoodland.org. Uh, please include um, in that email uh, the subject title of your comments and make sure that that email uh, does not um, extend beyond five minutes when read aloud. Mayor Landsberg and Councilmember Rodriguez serve on the City of Woodland's uh, Public Safety Subcommittee and both have uh, each recorded opening remarks that will be played to lead off tonight's conversation. Uh, before we transition though, I do wanna thank everybody for participating in this important community topic and look forward to the discussion this evening. Thank you. Hola, les saluda Xochitl Rodriguez, concejal y representante aquí de la ciudad de Woodland. Quiero darles la bienvenida a este primer foro comunitario dedicado a la seguridad pública y a usted. Quiero darle las gracias al alcalde Rich Landsberg, a nuestro jefe de policía Derek Half, a nuestro jefe de bomberos Eric Zane y al personal de la ciudad por hacer este foro posible. Quiero también hacerles saber que como miembro de, del Comité de Departamento de Seguridad Pública, estamos enfocados de traerles a usted la información más última en cuanto a la ciudad y al departamento. También, si han visto, hemos trabajado duro para diversificar nuestro departamento de policía. Para cuando haya ese proceso de transacción con la comunidad, tengamos un departamento que refleje y se, y se identifique con nuestra comunidad. Entonces, este foro hoy en día, vamos a presentarles información. Queremos que por favor nos traiga sus preguntas, porque queremos conectarse con ustedes. Y por favor, siéntase en confianza de venir a nosotros después de este evento y mandarnos sus ideas o preguntas, porque este foro es aquí para ustedes. Sabemos que hay mucha tensión. Este causa violencia nacional, causa las restricciones del COVID. Pero sea como sea, nos podemos comunicar, nos podemos unir más y traer en sí más seguridad a nuestra comunidad. Entonces, gracias por participar hoy en día. Por favor, los invito a que sigan en contacto con nosotros y manténgase seguro y mantenga su familia sana. Es un placer saludarles. Igual, otra vez, soy Xochitl Rodríguez, su representante aquí en la ciudad. Muchas gracias. Good evening. Tonight it is my pleasure to introduce Police Chief Derek Kaff as he walks us through tonight's first community conversation. Your city council made a commitment to work with the community on answering your questions and concerns about police and safety services in Woodland. As you know, many cities in America have suffered unrest as a result of the events that have unfolded across our country. Over the last few months, like many of you, 
I have experienced a series of difficult emotions, anger, frustration, despair, fatigue, and yes, hope. The heartbreak many of us have experienced when we watch the video coverage of George Floyd's encounter with Minneapolis police officers should never ever be forgotten. Even though these events were distant in miles, they still struck a chord right here in Woodland. Shortly after those terrible events unfolded, our city reacted in a much different manner. For days, our city experienced peaceful protests and demonstrations. I wish to again thank the young people for their display of peaceful protest. Our city did not experience the tragedies of loss of life, property destruction, and other illegal activity. I commend our young people for that. To the many people here in Woodland who engaged in peaceful, nonviolent protests for change, your city council stood with you. We heard you. Tonight, you will hear some of the ongoing efforts that our great, resilient, and strong city will be taking to make sure that our community is served by law enforcement professionals who are committed to keeping us safe, at the same time demonstrate restraint and respect for all people. Our collective resolve is certain and clear. We will not leave any of our residents behind. As a city, I charge all of us to work together in support of our neighbors and our law enforcement staff so that the dreams of our young people are not lost and that our path towards a fairer and just world remains within our reach right here in Woodland. Like you, I care for this city deeply. This is why I challenge all of you. We know what we must do. We have always known full justice, true justice, equity and inclusion amongst all human beings is the only solution. And I'm hopeful because of what our residents are telling us. They want to help. They have ideas for our future. There is no shortcut to get to our better place. It is not one thing. It is not one program. It is not one event. It is not one person. It is everything. It is all of us. So tonight, please join us as Chief Calf and his staff present their ideas and ambitions for our police department and his resolve to serve this community with the utmost respect and justice for all. After Chief addresses the community, he and members of his staff will be answering questions from the community. In closing, on behalf of the City Council, we truly hope that this community conversation is just the first of many to come. Thank you, Council Member Rodriguez and Mayor Landsberg. Everyone, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Chief Derek Calf with the Woodland Police Department. This is the first of several community meetings that we intend to have to try and educate the community on what the police department is doing. And some of the goals that we have are to inform, to educate, but probably most importantly, is to listen to the community. So after this video, I'm excited to hear what the community has to say. We want to know how we can better serve the community so that we are reflective of the values of this great community. I've been a police officer for nearly 25 years. For the last 20 years, I've been here at Woodland PD. And a lot has changed in that time, from the laws to the policies to the way that we do business. But probably one of the largest changes is in the area of transparency. 25 years ago, having a meeting like this live on Zoom, it never would have happened. So I, I hope to provide some context before we begin our discussion. We're gonna talk about crime. We're gonna talk about our policies, especially those surrounding use of force. And then I want to describe our community policing philosophy. And I hope that you'll see that that's woven throughout my talk this afternoon. Right now, the Woodland Police Department is staffed with 68 sworn police officers and 15 civilian support staff. 
In 2019, we handled about 61,000 calls for service. That's for a population of about 60,000 people. To try and provide some little context, and if we go back 10 years, in 2009, we had 71 sworn officers and 28 civilian support staff. At that point, we only handled 50,000 calls for service. But after the last recession, we lost a number of positions. So as you can see, the officers are a lot busier now than they were just 10 years ago. A lot of that has to do with how we're able to take calls in. Now we're continuing to work with the city to make sure that we rebuild in a thoughtful manner, but we're also trying to maximize our partnerships with not just other area law enforcement agencies, but with County Mental Health, the Yolo Conflict Resolution Center, and many other area partners. One of those partnerships is with Yolo County Health and Human Services Agency. So we just entered into, again, a partnership with them so that a county mental health clinician can be available for crisis situations. What this clinician does is responds as a first responder to mental health calls when they are on duty. When there's no crime that's been committed, we know that the best person to put into that situation is a trained mental health clinician. As an example of the type of calls that they handled, we had a lady that was calling 911 a couple of times a week because she thought she was getting threatening messages from her television. We made contact with her multiple times a week, but now with this mental health clinician, he was able to make contact with her and get her engaged in services, also working with her support system to make sure they had what they needed for her to get out of crisis. As a result, she doesn't call 911 anymore, and she's now receiving the services she needs. These are the type of wraparound services that we as a city are pursuing through partnerships and through the city itself. Now our officers do receive mental health training. It starts in the academy. They receive a block of training. Then again on field training, more and finally an in-service training, which is those annual trainings that officers are required to complete to maintain their certification. But in addition to that, the Woodland PD has uh, long been a proponent of providing mental health training for our officers. We send every single officer through the 40-hour crisis intervention training course. This is a really good course because it's evidence-based and it's based on best practices. One of the best parts of this course are the personal testimonies that they get to listen to by persons that have dealt with law enforcement when either they or a family member was in crisis. That's really impactful. That's the type of training that changes an officer's mindset more so than just reading from a book. In regards to our policies, so I wanted to remind everybody that all of our policies are posted on our website. We're gonna put that link up so that you can see that web address. So our policies are written by lawyers. They're not written by just the officers at the police department. And that's intentional because they are best practices and they meet or exceed all state and federal law. Now we meet with our employees quarterly to discuss any substantial changes that have come up in regards to policy. That's really important too, because we have to have employee buy-in and we have that here in Woodland. We have some good discussions about why we have to put things into policy to make our community safe. In regards to use of force, our policy bans the carotid restraint but it, more importantly, it requires a number of things that I want our community to be aware of. It requires de-escalation, rendering medical aid. There's a duty for the officers to intercede when they're observing excessive force. And we report on every single use of force incident 
We track that, we investigate it, and we look not just for discipline, but we also want to recognize trends so that we can provide additional training, so that we can constantly get better. We do participate in the National Use of Force database through the FBI. We report those to them annually. Our Woodland officers are among the most highly trained officers in the profession. That's evidenced by what we've seen cyclically throughout my career as our officers get routinely recruited to go and join uh, some police department in Sacramento or the Bay Area. It's because of how well trained they are. Now we meet and exceed all of the California peace officers standards and training guidelines and we're continually reviewing how we train, how much we train, and the methods that we're training in. We want it to be real world situations based specifically here for Woodland, not just something national. Now POST recently, uh, POST is the Peace Officer Standards and Training. They recently remodeled the use of force training after Senate Bill 230 was passed and it now focuses on our duty to intercede, de-escalation, interpersonal communication, implicit and explicit bias, cultural competency, and alternatives to using deadly force. So we are training on that all the time. In fact, in regards to our policies, we send training quizzes to our officers through a cell phone app where they get to read a scenario that is real li a real life situation. And then they have to evaluate that situation based on Woodland Police Department policies and answer questions in a quiz. And we do that 12 times a month. That's another way that we're trying to ensure that our officers are trained on our policies. Another area I want to talk about is our school resource officers. They provide some critical duties that we must complete for community safety. They build a bridge with the kids and offer a positive influence. The goal of our school resource officer program is a safe learning environment for both the students and the staff. Now we don't have an enforcement based program. And as evidence of that, in the last 10 years, we've reduced juvenile arrests by 89%. Our goal, using an evidence-based triad concept, is, is to work around the role of being an educator, a counselor, and a law enforcement officer. And we believe we are a critical part of that success team now, being a school resource officer is not for every law enforcement officer. You've got to have the desire to build relationships with kids because that's what it's really all about. We want to make sure that Woodland youth have every chance for success, irregardless of whatever their situation is at home and their abilities. We want to provide all we can for them. Another area I want to talk about is police officer mental health. We are actively working to develop better services and treatment options for acute trauma and PTSD because our officers face innumerable physical and mental challenges throughout their shifts. If you can imagine, it's very rare that anyone calls a police officer when they're having a good day. So our officers' jobs is to go from tragedy to tragedy. As a result, officer stress levels often lead to higher levels of alcoholism, depression, and all of the other stress-related illnesses. You know, being a police officer brings with it a suicide rate three times higher than that of the general public. So as an administration, we are seeking additional stress management training and services for all of our employees. 
We're working hard to change the culture inside the police department. One very visible way that we're doing that is we recently created a de-escalation room. This is a room inside the police department where after a traumatic incident, maybe they saw the death of a child or a terrible accident, that officer can tell their supervisor and go inside this de-escalation room, shut the door where they can just be alone for a few minutes so that they can collect themselves. This is super important as a manager, as a leader, for me to take care of our employees. But it ties right back into what we're talking about tonight because there's evidence-based studies that show the higher level of an officer's stress, there's a direct correlation to use of force incidents. Not just excessive force, but all use of force. So making mental health a priority in the Woodland Police Department is happening right now. It is a privilege to be a peace officer, even though it's tough. We know that we have a duty to uphold public trust. That's why I support a state level decertification of officers. When they resign in lieu of termination, they shouldn't be allowed to go to some other department only to be rehired. But I do believe there needs to be due process in that. Now, I think that the right vessel or agency to oversee this would be the California Peace Officer Standard and Training uh, Division. They already certify officers, so it makes logical sense to me that they would be the ones that are overseeing decertification as well. I'm a big proponent of body cameras. We were able to bring those and outfit all of our field staff with body cameras a few years ago, and they've actually been very helpful not just for the officers, but also for our victims, our witnesses, and court processes as well. It's so much more powerful to see that body camera footage and know exactly what happened. Having said that, a camera can't tell the full story. Sometimes you're only getting one angle, and sometimes there's other factors that play in, and we know that. But having body cameras here at Woodland PD is a good thing. I also support the Attorney General's office coming in to investigate deadly force incidents. It would add another layer of oversight in those critical community times when we all needed to feel like those investigations are being handled impartially. I believe the Attorney General's office is the correct place for those investigations because they can have trained staff. I think that true reform cannot happen without changing behavior. And this requires both positive and negative consequences. Earlier I was talking about transparency and how that's changed over time. Now here in Woodland PD, we fully supported and complied with Senate Bill 1421, which releases personnel files in certain circumstances. This was an expensive and time-consuming unfunded mandate by the state, but it was the right thing to do. We should be releasing those records. Right now, there are many additional bills in the California legislature to expand transparency but we have to follow the law. Whatever the law says at that time, that's what dictates what we can and cannot release when it comes to peace officer records and body camera videos. I believe that we have made significant progress in Woodland with our social media program. You know, this was really started by one of our sergeants, uh, Sergeant Hyde. He, he's pushed us to grow in the area of social media. And now we're taking another exciting leap as we transition from more of a one or a couple of employees doing all of our social media to try and push it to branch out throughout the department so that it's part of all of our duties. I recognize that social media is a powerful tool. 
and we're gonna continue to inform and to listen to our community through social media. Another way we're trying to stay relevant and transparent is through text messages. We utilize a company called SpiderTech to text when an officer is delayed go into a call. This is how we're trying to improve communication with the community. So when someone calls 911 to report a crime, if all the officers are tied up, they'll get a text message saying the officer is delayed. And then after the police report is taken, they're gonna get a follow-up text message with the case number, the officer's name, crime prevention tips, and how to get a copy of that police report because sometimes that's needed for insurance companies. We want to be more engaged and relevant. You know, basically, when you order something online, you can track that package from the minute you click buy. When you get test results now in the medical field, you can get those very quickly online. It's exciting now that in Woodland, the only agency in Northern California you're able to know when an officer is delayed and when they'll be showing up to your house. So we're gonna constantly be looking for other ways we can use technology to maximize our small workforce here in Woodland. Police work is still a noble and honorable profession. We've had a solid recruiting strategy here in Woodland for a while. And basically, we start uh, at a very young age with our Youth Public Safety Academy. From that, that's targeting middle school aged. Then we move into explorers for those that are around high school, and early college aged. From there, we encourage people to be involved in our volunteers and policing program. And right now we're trying to retool all of our part-time positions. We have six of them, but we're trying to retool those as entry-level positions for people that want to get into the field. We specifically look for people from Woodland, first of all, but we were looking for candidates that have empathy, good communication skills, and are diverse. We want to reflect the community in our workforce. But not only is it important for us to attract new candidates, but we've got to retain our existing officers. Earlier I talked about how well trained our officers are. That makes them very valuable to other agencies that pay a lot more than we do. So we try and work on having a good working culture, providing them with all the equipment that they need to safely and effectively do their jobs. And we appreciate all the support that the city has given us in the past and the community gives us even this day. But these are challenging times in law enforcement. The community's needs are constantly evolving. But we are open to thoughtful and meaningful change. And that's why we're having this series of meetings so that we can hear from you what crimes are important? What do you want us working on? And how do you want us doing it? Now we have to remember that there will always be a portion of the community that doesn't want to obey the laws and fit in with society. That's what these discussions are about. How do we address those issues? We can't ignore that there are powerful narratives in the news media to defund the police. I know this is a painful time, especially for our African American community. We are constantly evaluating our approach and our policies. The Woodland Police Department embraces community policing, thoughtful, systemic reforms, and involving and in the community to improve police training, policies, and procedures. Our department, community, and elected leaders have committed to dedicating resources to address these issues. All that defunding will accomplish is further reduce the ability of the police leaders and the community and elected leaders to enact the positive change that is required while still providing good service 
and safety today. We fully support additional resources given to social services, education, substance abuse treatments, and mental health programs. However, fulfilling this need should not come at the expense of police funding. Woodland Police remain the only entity of government that consistently and constantly responds to every situation where immediate help is needed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Last year, we began forming a Chief's Advisory Board. This diverse group of community members is going to be able to provide me with some very specific information coming from their segments of the community and how we as a police department impact them. It's about having discussions. It's about getting to know one another. It's just another means of transparency in the end. But we're just beginning this prog process. And I'll be honest with you, when COVID uh, hit and we had to go into the safer in place, that put the brakes on a lot of this stuff. But as we've learned how to communicate digitally, albeit it's a struggle sometimes, we know that this has got to be a high priority for us to get this Chief's Advisory Board up and running and strong. Police reform alone is not going to resolve all the socioeconomic and racial divides in our country. I support a holistic approach that incorporates equal education, mental health services, substance abuse treatment, rehabilitation and entry services when you're coming out of jail, housing, job opportunities that can and must all be improved at once. Yolo County and Woodland specifically has a long history of some great and creative programs along each of those lines be that our neighborhood court program, our restorative justice programs, or the creative job services that we've had throughout the years. Another thing that ties right into this is our youth gang reduction intervention and prevention program here in Woodland is being reimagined. It's been up and running now since about 2011. And it, we have a diverse group of leaders looking at how do we improve it for today's day and age? Because a lot has changed since it was first started. In conclusion, if you want to make a difference in the community and our police department, there's many ways you can help. Participate in our strategic planning surveys that are going to be coming out this fall as we enter our two-year strategic plan planning sessions and let us know what we should improve on and how we should improve. But I'd really ask that you'd sign up to be a volunteer. We have more than 30 community member volunteers right now who help us serve Woodland. And there's no better way to see what the police department is all about than serving inside the police department. You know, five years ago, we had a, a person come to the police department to complain about police in general. Five years ago, she was listening to a national narrative and she wanted to complain to her local police department. The chief of police at that time sat her down, listened to her, and had a conversation. He invited her, just as I just did, for her to become a volunteer. And she did. And now she serves three days a week, four hours a day, every week, inside the police department. And this person went from being a very big critic of law enforcement in general to now understanding how we are practicing law enforcement here in Woodland. When I talked to her just the other day, she told me that, and I encourage you to come and get a similar experience at Woodland PD. I'm grateful to serve Woodland, and together, we can meet the challenges of our growing community. But it takes collaboration and cooperation from all of us to meet these challenges. 
I look forward to continuing this journey with you. So thank you for your time and attention. Now let's get to some of those questions. I don't know, it keeps turning off. Here we go. It's like distance learning. The kids yeah. have to soon to join the class. We are, we're, we're there. Yeah. I see this. Start video. Mm -hmm. We have two hands up now. Three. Okay, it says it's unmuted. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us this evening. If this is what it's like to go to school online, uh, I'm gonna have to work on my grade, but I really appreciate everybody, all the staff members that have helped to make this happen. Um, you know, we are still working through the challenges of how to do these remote meetings, especially tonight's events are broadcast in both English and in Spanish. So if you hear us speaking a little bit more slowly, that's uh, in an effort to assist our wonderful translators that are helping us out tonight. They're taking time this evening to make sure we can connect with that portion of the community that speaks Spanish. So I'm Chief Derek Calf, and with me tonight, I have my Deputy Chief, Anthony Cucci, and I also have one of our school resource officers, Omar Flores. The three of us are excited to get to the questions. We received a lot of questions over the past, uh, honestly, the past few months. And uh, we will get to those. But before we begin to, and you know, you couldn't have predicted where we would be in 2020, but you also couldn't have predicted where we would be on September 8th, 2020. I, I just want to say that all of the fire victims and all of the fire department, um, they're in our thoughts throughout the state, throughout the Western states. Uh, these are unprecedented times, how stretched thin they are. So we really appreciate all of their efforts. And we are so sorry for those that have lost their lives and also that have lost their property. So tonight we are gonna talk about, uh, all, we're gonna get to, we already have a couple hands raised and we will get to those in just a second. Uh, but I wanted to remind everybody that tonight uh, is the first in a series of conversations and we're, we're gonna be talking primarily about use of force, uh, funding for the police department and uh, issues along those lines. With that, we did receive a couple of other questions that weren't really along those topics. We'll reply individually back to those individuals, and then that could probably be a topic for a future conversation. Because we know that issues surrounding homelessness and traffic, those are big community safety concerns here in Woodland. So we will get to those, just probably not tonight. So with that, uh, do we have any voicemails, emails, or hands raised? We have three hands raised. Okay. Who's our first hand? Sherry. Okay. Sherry, thank you for joining us tonight. 
Uh, Sherry, yes, can you unmute? Yes, Chief, I'm unmuted. Thank you. She is. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. I unfortunately might have been just a little bit late, but my concern and primary reason why I joined the meeting this evening is because I have a notorious issue on my street and on numerous occasions have tried to have somebody come out and look into the residence. And unfortunately, I've not gotten anywhere. And there's a steady traffic every day of suspicious people with bicycles that come in. And when they come back, they're loaded up full of stuff. And uh, it's just pretty sure it's probably drug related and stolen property. But unfortunately, can't seem to get anybody to come out and even cruise our neighborhood, you know, on a regular basis just to be present. You bet. Um, well, I'd like to contact you offline or have someone contact you offline so that we can get the details. But, um, you know, you're speaking to our community oriented or community policing philosophy. And I, they, let me first off say there is something we can do. Um, we, we are not in this alone. And what we are trying to do here in Woodland is respond with more than just a traditional approach. Lately, we've had a great partnership with our code enforcement division here in the city. They're not inside the police department, but they're another valuable resource. And so I believe that by getting some more information, having our officers work with code enforcement, we should be able to make an impact on the issues on your street. Our neighborhood would greatly appreciate that. We all, the probably four houses that actually face this particular home all have video surveillance because of the issues at this house. Yeah, it sounds like you're taking the right steps. First of all, making sure that you are contacting us anytime you're seeing something suspicious or illegal, no matter how many times it is. That's, that would be my first piece of advice. And then two, that video surveillance, because just like in the video when I talked about body cams, Nowadays, juries, uh, they really love to see video. And when we have that surveillance video from homes showing people committing the crimes, it just makes it that much more likely that we're gonna be able to get a successful prosecution. Thank you for calling. Appreciate it, Chief, thank you. Who is our next hand? Gary. 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 Okay, Gary, thank you for joining us this evening. Can you unmute yourself? Unmuted, <laughs> thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all. The question I have is uh, whether you have a, a list of uh, past use of force issues in Woodland that do or do not meet your current standards. And if, if, if that's something to look back on and get a feel for what kind of issues need to be addressed. Absolutely. Thank you for that question. So we started tracking use of force in what, three years ago. Yes. About three years ago is when we uh, officially started tracking every single use of force. Before I, I get into it any further, I wanna explain a little bit about our policy because I think that's really what tonight is about too. So when you talk about use of force from department to department, uh, the biggest variance is honestly, what is the definition of a use of force? Because there is no one standard definition. Each department head, each chief gets to set what that definition is. Here in Woodland, we have a very low threshold of what we consider a use of force. Basically, if you can imagine with me, picture an officer going to arrest somebody and put handcuffs on. When the person is putting their hands behind their back, if they muscle up, if they just tense up a little bit, if the officer uses physical force, so their muscles, to bring the hands back together, to be handcuffed, to overcome resistance, that's a reportable use of force in Woodland. If you look at a, 
you know, some of the really tech savvy agencies in the Bay Area, you'll see some incredibly low numbers for how often they use force. But then if you look at what is their definition of using force, it's typically a very high threshold. I think it's important to capture all of those even low level uses of force. So when force is used here in Woodland, a report is taken and then is uh, reviewed by the officer's immediate supervisor, which is typically either a corporal or a sergeant, and they make a determination initially if it is within policy or not. If they believe it's within policy, it's then going to run through the chain of command all the way up to the chief of police. And then I will make a decision whether it was within policy or not. If at any point during that process, anyone believes that the force was not within policy, then it goes into a separate investigation track for an administrative investigation. If you watch a lot of cop shows, they call them IAs. But so we would do an IA, and that's not saying that for sure something was wrong. What we're saying is we need to get the total facts surrounded by this. Once we look at those total facts, a report then again comes to the chief of police for final determination, and then I make a decision on that. Now, anytime serious force is used where somebody is injured, uh, we do report on that. And in the video I talked about our use of force reporting, we do both state level reporting and then we also do the federal level reporting. Uh, and so that's another level of oversight and um, tracking that the department engages in. Those are voluntary. Um, but I believe it's the right thing to do that we have additional people who are trained in the intricacies of using force, reviewing these to make sure they're within law and policy. Does that help? Thank you, Gary. And who is our next hand? Sebastian. Sebastian Glover would be the next one. Sebastian Glover, thank you for joining us. Can you unmute yourself? What? I'm right Perfect. here. Thank you. Go ahead. What does a school resource officer do? Excellent. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, for this one, I'm gonna let school resource officer Flores answer. First of all, I wanna say hi. How you doing, Sebastian? Oh, yeah, he's muted. He, huh? Oh, he was one of my uh, former kids at Woodland High. Uh, being a school resource officer, uh, it's it's a great a great duty to actually be on the front lines with the, with our youth and our community, and be able to mentor some of these kids. Uh, we do a lot of we wear different hats at schools. You know, we're a teacher, a counselor, a football coach at times, a parent. And I feel personally, I've been doing it going on six years. Uh, the last thing I feel like I am is a police officer. Um, you know, it's been a blessing to be able to mentor some of these kids. And for me personally, myself, uh, especially in a community like Woodland, where it has a lot of Mexican-American kids that come from broken homes. Uh, dad might not be in the picture. So it allows me to use my platform uh, to kind of get back to the kids, you know, because like I said before, in some of my other interviews, I kind of grew up the same way and I had a, an officer mentor me and help me through high school and getting a further education was my way out of where I came out of, um, which was, you know, struggling, my mother working in the fields, trying to make money and stuff. So now I'm able to go back and, you know, mentor these kids, be a part of these kids' lives, and especially in this community, you know, Woodland's uh, special community. Uh, I see it with a different lens than what goes on around us in the world and in this country. And I feel blessed to be here working with you guys and partner up with the schools, the teachers, the school district or police department. I felt that in the last six years I've been at the police department as a school resource officer, we've grown. We've brought the police department to the school. Um, the chief doesn't know about it yet, but I got a call from Mr. Hernandez, who's a, a teacher at Woodland High. He's in charge of the criminal justice program there. And his program in the last few years has grown from one class to 175 kids, well, he's actually turning them down. 
because there's got no more classes, no more periods. And he wanted me to touch base with the chief. The chief's been a guest speaker in this class. And uh, to kind of start a program, we already have our Explorer program, which we have high school age kids, 14 to 18, at our police department. And he wants to even partner up even more where he could have a lot of his kids and have our feeding program from the high school. So the youth that want to do law enforcement or just get experience in anything like that, uh, join us and be a part of it um, and stuff. So it's, it's a blessing. I think uh, being a school resource officer is everything but being a police officer. And that's my own personal opinion. My kids will hear me say that when uh, myself or the deputy chief are coaching powder puff or we're counseling a kid or playing coach or mentoring. And uh, it's a great way to reach the kids, uh, see us as a human being, even though we wear the uniform, uh, we act more like teachers. Um, so. Yep. Deputy Chief Gucci. Former he, SRO. Yeah, former SRO. Do you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the unique piece of being an SRO is the relationships that Officer Flores had talked about, but those relationships don't stop. Um, I call my kids my kids, but they're all like 35 years old now and have teenage kids, and often they'll I'll talk to them about what's going on with their child. And recently, me and Officer Flores, one of my old SRO students as a high school student that was having some difficulties at school and we were able to connect. And I don't know if that conversation would have happened if we didn't have that relationship already built. So it really allows our officers to go deeper into the community and uh, really relate to the people that we're working with every day. Thank you. Are there any other hands raised yet? Okay. So I'm going to start getting into some of the emails that we've received. Um, we received an email from Christina Danielson, and she asked, I'm curious about the Woodland Police Department's force policies and what, if any, steps, actions are taken to reduce police-involved violence and unnecessary use of force. So Woodland PD has a robust use of force policy. Uh, it's, it requires de-escalation um, in anything that is not an emergency situation. It requires us to render medical aid. There's a duty for officers to intercede when they observe excessive force. And it requires us to report force, as I said already. Uh, we've also banned the carotid restraint, and we're constantly reevaluating our policies. Um, I think it's a good time to talk a little bit about how our policies come into existence. And, you know, I mentioned during the video that they're made by lawyers. Uh, criminal law is very, uh, very detailed, and the laws are always changing. We get updates on case law almost weekly, if not daily. And so it's important that we have people constantly watching our policies to make sure that we are following all of the ever-changing laws. But the other side of that is best practice. We are constantly updating our policies to make sure they're in line with best practice because the real world is not binary. It's not ones and zeros. The real world is very emotional, very fast paced, and constantly changing. And so we rely heavily on experts that do evidence-based studies on police tactics so that our officers can respond in a professional, safe, and ethical manner. Just since March, we've already updated our use of force policy twice. This would have been happening had the community not asked us to do this. We update our policies typically three or four times a year. With use of force, California has led the nation with some of the most restrictive and prescriptive policies and requirements for peace officers. 
when you talk to officers from other states, the issues that they are going through, California has had in place for a long time. And I think that's one of the good things about California. But here in Woodland, we're always looking at our policies and sometimes the changes come from our line level officers. When they're taking those tests and reading about the policies, they'll bring up situations that they ran into at two in the morning on a Sunday night in absolute pitch darkness that doesn't fit neatly into the black and white text of a policy. That forces us to have open and honest dialogue with the employees and sometimes with those lawyers about how do we make sure our policy serves the community? Because remember, at the end of the day, I've got to make sure all of those officers go home safe. And I've got to protect everybody in this community. And it's a balance. So, Gary, thank you very much for that question uh, earlier. And this was, I guess, Christina's question. Um, we received an email from Jeffrey Burke. Jeffrey said, he would like to know what the position of the police chief will take if and or when civil disobedience may enter the city. Will the city council, along with the police chief and regional law enforcement officials protect life and property? Does the police department have a plan in place to prevent folks from destroying and burning properties within city limits? Short answer, yes, we have a plan. And it's always changing. Police work is not like many other jobs. Uh, police work is different every single day and every single call. We welcome peaceful protest here in Woodland and we support the right for free speech, but we're not gonna allow people to vandalize and injure others. We've seen that happen across the country. Our goal is to provide a safe place for people to express themselves peacefully. The mayor mentioned the earlier protests. We actually made two arrests during those protests, not of the protesters, but of outside people that were coming in to cause a disturbance and start up and incite trouble here in Woodland. We wouldn't allow it. We made those arrests and allowed the protests to continue peacefully because that's our job. Deputy Chief Cucci, can you explain a little bit too more about these protests and our previous activity? Yes, um, back in May, we had a, a series of protests um, about police brutality. And it was a unique group they, um, that we connected with, we got to speak with um, and they were open to dialogue. And I think that was the important piece of this group was that they, they wanted to have ongoing conversation about police reform, police brutality, uh, but wanted us at the table to have that conversation because they knew if they wanted real change, they needed to talk to everybody involved. Uh, we were able to um, meet. The, some of the group members came down to the police department. I invited them down for a tour and got to see kind of what we do as police officers, the equipment we use, how we do it in Woodland. They did have people show up that had a different agenda, uh, and that was not okay because they really wanted to, to see this move forward in, in a positive light. And it was really unique to sit, watch this group mix with our downtown business owners uh, who wanted the, them to have their moment of free speech it was a really hot day. They offered them water uh, for their march. And um, it really showed how Woodland can do things right yep. and how um, really kept us out of it, uh, except for our open dialogues. So yep. It was a good event. 
Okay. Our next uh, email question came from Perry Rominger. He says, I'm writing today to demand steps be taken immediately to instate policies to end police violence. As someone born and raised in Woodland, I hold the city in high regard and therefore have high expectations for the place my family calls home. Campaign Zero has outlined eight policies that at your discretion could be enacted today. The eight policies that follow have demonstrated the ability to decrease police violence by 72% in cities that adopt. Ban chokehold and strangleholds, require de-escalation, require verbal warning before shooting, exhaust all other means before shooting, duty to intervene, ban shooting at moving vehicles, require use of force continuum, require all use of force be reported. First, I would like to know how many of these policies are currently enacted. And second, I would like to know how can we go about adopting those that aren't currently policy? Woodland PD has been progressive in our approach to use of force. We, um, a lot of the, there's gonna be a lot of overlap with the email questions because people don't know what someone else has already emailed. But many of these eight can't wait recommendations are already in place in the department. In fact, seven of them were already in place before um, we banned the use of the carotid restraint uh, way back in May, right. in May. Um, so all eight are in there. Um, and I hope that that does uh, absolutely reduce using force. Um, or just as a reminder, everybody, you can review all of our policies online. If you go to woodlandpolicealloneword.org, that's the shortcut to get to our website. And under SB 1148, uh, 1197, I'm sorry, I'm getting my Senate bills mixed up. Senate Bill 978, there's a tab. That's got the link. Because again, California is pretty progressive. Before all of this stuff started happening this spring, uh, California already made it law that we post all of our policies on our website. So we, we did all of that already. So those policies are there. I hope that everybody goes and looks at them. And again, this is gonna be an ongoing conversation. This email address of community safety questions at cityofwoodland.org, that remains live long after this meeting. So as you're reviewing those policies, if you have questions, email us, let us know. We wanna have a discussion about why can you not outright ban shooting at moving vehicles? Well, frankly, we, so we ban shooting at moving vehicles unless the vehicle is the threat. So, Deputy Chief Cucci, do you want to explain how this works? Yes. Um, so the officer that's in that position, if the vehicle is coming at the officer or a uh, citizen, and the only way to stop that vehicle from uh, being used as a weapon against the officer or the citizen is to fire the weapon at the, the driver, uh, then that use of force would be allowed. But what, what the, the difference is if, if we can move ourselves out of that situation without firing, that would be the preferred technique. Um, but all, it's all, if it's feasible, if we have the time to do it, but if that's the only course of action that the officer has, at their disposable, then that would be a valid use of force. In plain English, what we're talking about is if the car is coming at the officer, if the officer can get out of the way, they need to get out of the way by our policy. You can't just stand there holding your ground. Years ago, when I started being a cop, people did that. And we saw in our nation shootings happening like that. We now train to get out of the way. That's when, when you get out of the way and the car keeps tracking the officer, trying to run them over, yeah, at that point, they can shoot at a moving vehicle. Because, I, again, I can't explain how complex it is to be an officer 
And remember, the, these people are out there do, trying to do their best. This is why hiring is important. This is why we need the best of the best in our community to want to serve and be officers. We want people that are critical thinkers, that are invested in this community, and want to see us all do good, all do good. Okay. Uh, at this point, I'm going to ask again, do we have any voicemails or hands raised? Okay, I got plenty more emails for us to get through. Uh, our next email is from Aaron Brunei. Aaron asks uh, a number of questions, but uh, first one being, are police officers in Woodland Police Department being trained to de-escalate altercations by using peaceful conflict resolution strategies? Yes, we absolutely are. Uh, so officers receive initial training in the academy. After they graduate from the police academy, they get additional training on our field training. Uh, officer Flores was one of our field training officers. Deputy Chief Cucci was one of our field training officers. Over the years, what happens is the more experienced and best officers end up becoming field training officers. We teach de-escalation during field training and then it's a part of our training cycle for ongoing training. Years ago, it used to just be one class. You had to take it once every two years. The reality is de-escalation is so important, we've interwoven it into all of our training. So de-escalation is a part of our firearms training, our defensive tactics training, and of course, tactical communications. Because our words and our body language makes a big difference. We know that. I also want to talk about Senate Bill 230. So that, that's another one where California was leading the way. Because Senate Bill 230 requires that officers use de-escalation techniques, crisis intervention techniques, and other alternatives to force whenever feasible. Notice again that even in the state law, it says whenever feasible, because there's going to be times when it's not feasible. So Senate Bill 230 also mandates that our policy require that officers conduct all duties in a manner that's fair and unbiased, and that officers be trained in alternatives to deadly force and de-escalation techniques. The Woodland Police Department fully complies and our policies fully comply with Senate Bill 230. Aaron also asked, are the police officers in Woodland Police Department from, forbidden from using carotid restraint? I, I think we, we've gone over that one enough. Yes, we are. Are the police officers at Woodland PD required to intervene if they witness another officer using force, excessive force? Yes, we are. Are the police officers in the Woodland Police Department from forbidden from shooting at a moving vehicle? Same question. Let me see if I find another one. Uh, carotid. You want to talk about hard time? Uh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Aaron asked if we were uh, forbidden from hog tying or, or placing somebody face down. Uh, we don't hog tie, and that's really putting the arms in legs behind the back, putting someone face down in a position where they could actually suffocate. Uh, we use a, a device called the wrap. Officer Flores is also an instructor on this device. So if someone's combative and we need to stop them from kicking, it, it does demobilize the legs, but it keeps you in an upright seated position where we know that you can breathe, you can talk, and then also, we're going to be evaluating the person throughout the detention, have them medically cleared uh, by policy, bring medical in as necessary, you know, to check on our prisoners. Um, Flores, have I missed anything on that wrap? No, uh, like the chief and deputy chief said, um, you know, the wrap is a tool that it just uh, takes away what I would say their legs. So their upper body, their chest, their lungs, they're in a recovery position at all times. And uh, it's, a, it's actually a great tool. And uh, we're always having officers around the person, checking up on them, uh, making sure 
everything's fine, they're breathing, they're restrained, uh, they go to the hospital. And, you know, when it comes to use of force, I say with uh, the police department, being a DTAC instructor myself is uh, our department, even previous to Mr. Floyd's incident, um, they've been above and beyond with the training they give us, you know, always seeking kind of setting what I would think. Even in, in the, when I became a defense tactic instructor, one thing I did uh, like coming from the San Cruz County Sheriff's Office myself uh, was how progressive and uh, up to date and wanting to be held at a, a above average standard when it came to use of force. And that's the reason I became an instructor, um, you know, because I said, hey, you know, this is these guys are really good. They're putting their money and their training and time into having an elite department when it comes to that. So you're right. We do. When I look back and I see some stuff personally that happens on TV, I kind of do get upset because I'm like, what's going on with that state or that department? You know, I see the bar personally with Woodland in California. And it's like, I even get upset from what I'm seeing on TV because it's just not right. That's not the way we do business and they need to catch up and you're right. You know, that's one thing that you, Chief, have, you know, you pushed a lot is to keep going and get the best thing up there, change things, be transparent and do the right thing for these people. And I can speak as, you know, because I love this community and the citizens I deal with and I see it from the different side. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. We do have a hand raised too. When there's a lot of... Okay, good. Who is this hand that's raised? It's Gary Wagner. Ah. I'm... Uh, Unmuted. Okay. <laughs> I didn't realize that before that I had the, that I got muted and had to unmute. Anyway, yep. uh, a couple of questions. One, on the mental health clinician, uh, how long have we had them and how many calls for service have they had? And then the other question I had was on the use of force, the different categories that you put that in, uh, levels of severity. And then which ones are justified, which ones are not justified? Is it is information available on that for the public? Okay, thank you, Gary. So two questions, got them, I think I've got them both. Uh, so one is gonna be about the, the mental health clinician. I'll give a little background on that. And then Deputy Chief Gucci, I'll ask you to give a little more background on the use of force. Okay. Nope, sound good? Okay, so as far as the mental health clinician, so, um, we are very fortunate to have uh, Rob Villarreal working with us here in the city of Woodland. Um, just like being a police officer is not for everybody, being a mental health clinician is not for everybody in the field because uh, the, the interactions that they have are not like a clinical setting. Um, so Rob started back with us in July. We were able to get this uh, partnership back up and running but Rob worked with us for two years prior. Uh, we had about a two year, maybe a three year break in between where we ran a crisis intervention program here in Yolo County. It was looked at nationally as a model of what to do. Unfortunately, it lost grant funding and went away. Um, but we knew here in Woodland that this was a successful program. And so uh, the city council actually took a first step uh, just over two years ago, and we brought in the first clinician who works on our homeless outreach uh, street team. Uh, she was our first clinician to come back. She spends 40 hours a week, uh, every week, uh, working with folks and helping them either that are in crisis or experiencing homelessness to get out of homelessness. As far as the mental health clinician that's currently responding to 911 calls, to uh, when people are experiencing crisis here in town. I did see some numbers there. It wasn't even a full month in January or July, but he had already responded to 43 calls for service. And of those, seven of them resulted in uh, people being placed on holds. But that's not the most impactful thing. For any of you that have a family member that does uh, experience crisis, you know what it's like. An officer comes in, a mental health clinician comes in, and they work with you or that person in crisis for an hour, two hours, three hours, and then they go home. But you're left behind still working with and living with and trying to support that person that's in crisis. 
what our clinician is able to do is to connect that support system with other resources that are already available here in Yolo County. And sometimes it's just education. A lot of times people don't know what help is out there. As I said earlier, in 2019, our officers handled 61,000 calls for service. They're busy. They don't have the time to stay there and handle that. Because unfortunately, we're still experiencing a lot of violent crime here in Woodland. That's what the officers need to be focusing on. And they don't have enough time just to focus on that. So having a mental health clinician that once a scene is stable, he can eat, they can come in, or if the scene's already stable, the officers don't even ever have to go. That's fiscally responsible and it's safer for everybody. We'd rather have the officers doing those things that only a police officer can do. And let's have other people do those things that they can do. Deputy Chief Cucci. Hey, use the floor. So I'm make sure I'm answering your question correctly. So if I miss anything, please let me know. So you are looking for what is and what is not approved use of force and then what the numbers of use of force that we have in the department. And um, what, basically what if you categorized them from, you know, the minor thing like stiffening up when he's cuffed to, uh, you know, r real use of force, whether they get categorized and then whether they, uh, 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 get if, how the evaluation comes out. Are they justified, not justified? I was wondering yes. if that information is available to the public. Um, through our public record acts request, we could share some of our use of force data with you. Anything that's on officer discipline or anything that is, is protected, we wouldn't be able to let you in, see into a police officer's file uh, by law but we could absolutely share numbers on what types of use of force that we have and numbers of use of force that we have throughout a year. Um, when a use of force is, is reported by the supervisor, and as the chief had mentioned, we have a broad definition, they're all treated the same when they come in and they're evaluated on whether or not uh, the force was appropriate for the situation. And as they come through, each, the first line supervisor, the manager, and then to me, we're, we're looking at <clears throat> everything from the force itself, the equipment used, the effectiveness of the equipment or the, or the, the hold or the control hold that we use to evaluate our training. So it's not just, are we looking at the officer is doing, did something correctly or maybe illegal, and then we, we could deal with that but then we also look at our training. Does this, does this taser work? Does it, is it effective? And should we be, or, or there's some training that we need to do with our officers so that it works better down the road. And so it's a complete evaluation of the call for service. And then uh, from beginning to end was the verbal commands given in the beginning clear enough? Did they work? Why didn't they work? So it's, it's not, it's a hard line in the sand to say, you know, when, when something was right or wrong. So it, it, each, each incident is its own unique set of circumstances. And we look at the totality of all the circumstances when we make that decision whether or not force was appropriate or not. I want to add on to that just a bit. Um, and something, I mean, unless you, you do this, you probably, I wouldn't, expect you to keep up on case law and, and trends in this. But, you know, in the Ninth Circuit, something that has changed over the last few years is we used to look at police use of force just in the moment that it happened. That's it right there. But now what we have to do is we have to look at everything that led up to that. Why did the officer find themselves here? And was all that appropriate also? So if this stuff was not appropriate, even though the force was appropriate, we're going to be 
evaluating that as well. And that that's because of case law that has changed. Um, so it's, it, it is very complex to say the least. And that's my apprehension on people who do not have the proper training and experience. And that's not to say that any one of us, everybody on this call couldn't go through, uh, and I'm not talking police academy, but you know, to get up to speed on what is police litigation, what are the criminal laws and the civil laws attached to all this, and then uh, become at a level when you can uh, assist uh, or make those determinations. Yeah? Yes, I think so. I hope that answered your question, Gary. Gary, it was cutting in and out there, but I, it looks like you're unmuted right now. Could you repeat that last part? Do you have any in the last three years of the use of force that uh, you've judged is not justified? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh huh. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Deputy Chief Cucci and I uh, just over. You know, we we've all been here a long time, right? And. Um, he and I have been uh, part of the internal affairs process for, I don't know, since 2005 or something like that, either in an investigating role or uh, now in decision-making roles. Um, over that time, I can think of three officers that were terminated. Um, now, not all of them are use of force incidents. But I just mentioned that in a broad sense so that you can see that Woodland has a culture of accountability. Um, it's not just us making these decisions, too. When we get to a level of that seriousness, we're having the city attorney review these investigations as well because they're not part of the police department. They don't owe someone else wearing this uniform anything, they are dealing with looking out for the best interest of the city. I hope that I've built enough trust with everyone that you believe me when I say that's what I'm doing as well. But I know that the reality is there's a portion of the population that doesn't have a trust in the police department. And so that's why we do have, in those instances, the city attorney's office involved and they're not just attorneys, they're specifically trained in police force, litigation, and all of these policies that we're dealing with. Uh, I think that that's a really important message that the community understand, that it's not just the police department. You wanna add anything to that? I would add that in some of those instances, we've had the district attorney office run a parallel invest criminal investigation and then determine whether or not charges were appropriate against the police officers. Yep. Yep. Sounds good. Thank you much. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. I have another hand raised uh, for Robin. Ah. All right. Robin, go Hello. ahead. Hi, guys. Um, Hi. First, I wanted to um, endorse uh, Chief Calf. I think you're amazing. Um, I really do believe that you are working on the things that many of the people are questioning you about. Um, in my experience with you, because we've had a few conversations, um, I've really found you to be somebody who is very open um, and really trying to work towards the things that you're saying about. So I, I really want to get that across up front because I think it's really important to uh, why we're all here. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Uh, so I had a few, uh, a few notes that I wanted to talk about. Um, one would be, um, I had a question about what is the process for somebody to file grievances um, about, um, uh, like make complaints, um, pos like uh, people who are going into custody, uh, people who are uh, within the process of being arrested. What is a grievance process that they might be able to go through? Do you have one established already in policy? And how easy is it for them to access? Is it utilized often? Sure. Uh 
since we, we have a timer, do you want to, I'm taking notes here. So I'm going to talk about grievances in our process. Do you want to let me know your other questions and then I'll just kind of hit them all? Certainly. Okay. Um, so the other things I had questions about were um, uh, in terms of use of force, we're often talking about excessive use of force uh, when we're talking about use of force incidents. And I wanted to know if you had considered within your, within your office, um, a policy that was more on a continuum. So for instance, most of the time what people are talking about are, are taser incidents or, or um, shootings and things like that. But use of force and abuses of use of force often can be much uh, smaller. And those are often underlooked at. And, I, I, I'm, and the way that I have dealt with those in policy situations in law enforcement um, has been to have policies that are more on a continuum. And we, we're all talking about the highest um, events on a continuum. And I'd like to know if you guys have considered um, doing a continuum that includes much smaller events that are also things where uses of force could happen. Um, that was one of my points. And then the other was to talk about some forensic training. Um, I had experience working with Rob recently on a, on, on a, um, on a call. I specifically knew that there was a clinician and I could request that clinician and, um, and I was pretty happy with the outcome. Um, I stayed with the person so that I could make sure that he got help through, through the team. Um, but, but my background has a lot to do with forensics and dealing with people in law enforcement situations. Um, and one of the things that, that I recognized is that there's, there's a, there was definitely, um, a place where there could be more um, understanding of what it's like to deal with forensic people that are in a helping position who need help, but they have this background and distrust from from having had law enforcement backgrounds um, and and having been incarcerated and things like that. That I'm curious, what kind of specific training about how to engage those people does your department um, have? Um, have you considered expanding that? Um, and that's kind of the, the three main points that I um, wanted to bring up here. I also wanted to commend uh, the work that Rob did um, within, that, within that experience because um, it was great work. And from what I saw, I thought it was, um, I thought it was effective. I'm pretty sure the guy uh, got help and not just incarcerated. And that was probably my, my driving factor there. So thank you very much. Thank you. Robin, thank you. Um, just so in regards to the grievance process, um, you know, so we, we absolutely have a grievance process. Um, we post uh, our, you know, if, you, if somebody wants to make a complaint, they can again go to woodlandpolice.org. It's right there on our website to make a complaint. You can also just call uh, the non-emergency dispatch line and ask to speak to the on-duty supervisor they will take your complaint or you can email um, the police department as well to make those complaints. Now, when we talk about in the moment, and, and if I understood a little bit in either way, it's a good thing to talk about. Um, when somebody has contact with the police department, it's not uncommon for them to disagree with the officer's assessment of the situation. If any of you have ever been pulled over before, you may have felt that way. You may have thought, I didn't do whatever the officer thinks I did. Let me get this out there. The safest way to make a complaint about that is after the incident. Arguing during the incident um, it is not the safest way to handle that. That's why we have a court process and that's why we have our internal affairs process. Um, we, will, we will look at everything after the fact. But to me, it is more important that everybody, the person who's being contacted and the officer, both go home safely that night, as opposed to getting into an argument and heaven forbid, some type of physical altercation over a disagreement on that interaction. Let us look at it afterwards. In addition, you can contact our city council members when you have a complaint like that. That's what they're for. They are a review board of the police department. They know uh, I'm talking with them every month. They bring up concerns to me. They have the community's ear. 
So people will bring up complaints to the city council and then they uh, have us look into it and we report back what we find. So there are processes in place, but the time to argue, and I'm not saying you can't disagree, but there's a level of disagreement versus it turning into somebody getting arrested or unfortunately force getting used. Look, we don't want to have to use force. Um, and that really ties in to that last piece too. When we talk about, you know, there are clinicians and then there are forensic uh, persons and clinicians. So the crisis intervention training is a 40 hour course that we send our officers through. There is now a piece of that that does talk about the different types of mental health professionals and how that gets interact, uh, how to interact most successfully with each of them. Because it's very different when we go here in town and speak to a mental health professional um, at one of the uh, businesses or at when they're out at somebody's home versus even when we go to the hospital. Those are two totally different environments and the needs and the types of information and how to interact so that we can get the best service possible for the person in crisis is totally different. So the crisis intervention training um, is a big part of that. Now, uh, it's my understanding that Rob is actually going to be our new crisis intervention trainer for the, all of Yolo County. Um, Rob is uh, developing uh, new trainings uh, for our officers all the time, um, be that just through simple interactions as he sees things and he realizes, hey, this could have gone better. You could have said X, Y, and Z, or you could have written X, Y, and Z in these reports, then he gives us that feedback. So I'm absolutely open, and I know that that's an area that we can improve dealing with the different um, levels and experience and expertise in the mental health profession. Uh, and Robin, if you have insight and input, I would love, uh, maybe we can talk offline because, I, I mean, this is an hour or two conversation probably just on this topic alone. Um, I'm, I'm doing a lot of talking, and I, and I feel bad. You guys are just sitting here. No, Did, you, could you want to talk about the excessive force part of that? Um, okay, just, just you know, me. when – so with our levels, uh, you know, in our policy, we do address various levels. It's basically a continuum. Oh, the continuum, okay. Um, yes, the continuum, so far, far, and I'll have Officer Flores help me with this, what he teaches. The continuum for us is we have a lot of tools for us to be able to, to deal with situations. And we want to deal with situations at the lowest level, verbal, talk it out, ask for compliance. And then as a situation escalates, we're trying to de-escalate it again, verbally, but um, these things can move very rapidly. So we, we don't follow steps, so to speak, to before I can do A, I got to do B and then C. It's, it's, it's what level of force is coming at me as an officer and then what I need to use to overcome that and probably the most safe and just uh, the lowest level of force to deal with that situation. And it's when feasible... Is this, these situations can be so rapid. We talk about officers getting ambushed with gunfire. Immediately at that point, the, the immediate return of force would probably be deadly force. So those, that something that, that's happening within seconds, and we're not going to be able to go through every piece of use of force that we have. And yeah, I, I, that. yeah, I agree with that. As an instructor, we do teach you know, to start from the bottom and work your way up. And uh, right before verbal, we get, we got our physical presence. Just the fact of us showing up in uniform should be the lowest point and then verbal and uh, work your way up. Um, I do as an instructor myself uh, in training class, I do tell the new officers or the old officers, you know, it's easier to start from the bottom, work your way up than to start high, work your way down. But just like Deputy Chief said, there is that lo the real life scenario where if you go to a situation and you're getting shot at or you know you got to respond and you immediately got to jump to that high of a level uh for that use of force and 
you know, we do, we, you know, we train our officers, you know, as physical uh, presence is your first option. Then your verbal, you know, your mouth, I tell the officer, that's your number one tool is uh, 90% of the time it's your mouth. And I, you know, I, you can tell, I do like to talk. I, I tell the young <laughs> officers, you know, it's common sense, you know, be a human, just treat that person, no matter how good or bad the situation is, the way you would like other police officers to treat your family member. How would I like uh, Watsonville PD to treat my brother or my mom in that situation? That's what I, you got to think about. So that's, yeah, you hit it, you covered it. Yeah, it is. Yeah, a lot of our training too is about just getting physical space to allow you to have options for de-escalation, right? Um, space and cover, you know, protection is, is a big deal in use of force. And, and again, getting people just to slow down, you know, for, I, I know Robin has a lot of historical experience. She knows uh, this stuff, but years and years ago, police departments had, uh, they, they had a, a continuum of force or before that, they even they had a ladder of force that at, you had to do A and then you could do B and then you could do C. But two things happened with that. Same with the continuum. The continuum is, was a little bit better, but with the steps of force, two bad things uh, were happening with that. One was officers were getting injured because in a situation where it made perfect sense that they should use an impact weapon, they knew that they had to use the verbal, then use uh, wrist locks, twist locks, and then use the impact weapon. And so as officers that weren't, they were trying to follow policy, they were getting hurt. Conversely, you had citizens getting hurt um, because the officers were trying to follow that versus what we actually want at the end of the day is officers that can think for themselves very quickly on their feet that don't want to use force except as a last option. The something that we need to talk about here is there is a very, 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 very small portion of the community that just doesn't want to follow the rules. And they don't want to comply with our verbal commands and they don't care how many times we talk to them. So one of these uncomfortable discussions that we have in the department is, should we only be arresting those people that are that comply? If somebody just won't go with the program, should we just let those people get away with it? I don't think so. There has to be a balance there. And that's the that's why we need critical thinking officers that are making those decisions. It's complicated. When you add in somebody being intoxicated, somebody having the worst day of their life under tremendous stressors and pressures, let alone if there's any type of mental crisis, these are recipes for disaster. Um, that's why you hear nationally uh, a lot of law enforcement leaders talk about, we need more training, we need more training. I fully agree. We absolutely need more training. But we also have got to be freeing up space uh, to have these discussions to find the best ways to solve these situations in a way that doesn't reward that super tiny portion of the population that doesn't want to go with the program, that an overwhelming majority of our community reaches out to me and tells me, make sure you're getting them arrested. We have to, I have to balance the department between we've got to make those arrests in a safe fashion, in a legal fashion, hopefully causing zero injuries to anybody, officers or suspects. Um, that's, that's how difficult this discussion is. And it's, it's changing all the time. Uh, I mean, just this year, we had an officer, there were uh, six, um, six officers from a, another local agency had seen this guy vandalize the old courthouse uh, with a rock. Our officers got there. They tried de-escalation. They tried. They tried. They tried. Eventually, the suspect ended up smashing a giant, uh, like, cantaloupe-sized rock into the mouth of one of my officers. Yeah, at that point, we're, we need to get that person in custody as safely as possible. 
our officers do get hurt. Uh, we don't talk about it. If you follow us on social media, we don't talk about that stuff. Um, but I, I don't have the exact statistics today, but 172 officers have died in the line of duty in 2020 already. Um, that's on my officers' minds. They have families. They have lives. And I need to get them home to their families as well. They, and that's what tonight is about, is a discussion, right? How do we meet in the middle? How do we do this job safely? And I'm open to input about changing the way we do business, what our policies are. Sound good? Yep. Okay. Are there any more hands raised at this point or voice questions? Sebastian again? Okay. We've got a few more from Aaron. Okay. Uh, Sebastian, welcome back. Sebastian, are you there? Yeah, sorry, my computer lost connection. Oh, no problem. I hear you now. Which school is an or the SROs are assigned to? Uh, we got currently three SROs. Uh, one's assigned to Woodland High and Lee Middle School. Uh, second SRO is assigned to Pioneer High School and all the elementary schools in the district. The third one would be assigned to Cash Creek High School in the town of Yolo and Douglas Middle School. Thank you, Sebastian. Oh, one more question. Okay. How often the school resource officers go to the school? Um, well, on a prior to COVID, Sebastian, um, on a regular school day would be, uh, they would spend all day at the school, uh, whether it's at one school, depending on what they have going on, or if it's just making the rounds and saying hello, make touch and base with teachers and the students, parents. Uh, they, most of the time we spend the whole shift at a school site. And if calls come in or contacts or stuff like that, we'll head on to that school and take care of that. But our priority is to be at the school sites uh, with the kids. Thank you, Sebastian. One more question. The, are, do the SROs go to, to elementary schools? Yes, we have one uh, SRO assigned to the elementaries. Uh, not just one, but I, all three of us make it out there. I don't know if you know, Sebas, it's a little bit uh, younger. All of our fourth grade, fourth graders all across the district, we teach a great class, which is a little education on gangs and drugs and bullying and stuff like that. So all fourth graders get that. It's a six-week program. So we do make it to all elementary schools in the district. That's amazing. Thank you, Sebastian. Okay, we got about... 15 minutes left. Um, we've got two emails here that I really I want to get to. Um, the first one from Diana Moreno. Uh, she asked, I would like to ask what Woodland PD has as protocol to de-escalate dangerous and volatile situations that involve officers and people to avoid the use of deadly or excessive force. Um, our officers receive de-escalation, as I said already, throughout their careers. Um, and really the purpose behind that is to de you know, to relieve those tense situations, right? It's, uh, it can be very complex when you're dealing with those. So we try to use, avoid using force all the time. Um, they're trained to exhaust all these de-escalation techniques any time that they can, but sometimes it can't be avoided, uh, especially when it means protecting the public. Uh, I think everybody can come up with scenarios where sometimes you have to act very quickly. I wish that that weren't true, but unfortunately that is true. That's where training comes in. We need to have the officers, and we do have the officers so well trained that they're able to respond quickly in those situations and then immediately go right back to de-escalation. That is the expectation. Just because you use a level of force doesn't mean you have to stay at that level of force. You're constantly evaluating the situation 
for appropriateness and then as quickly as possible de-escalating back down to the lowest level of force possible. Um, and then we also got an email from Paul Bradford. Paul asked, what is the Woodland Police Department doing to examine its own officers to look within and to eliminate liabilities from those bad apples from within? Could you, could you want to talk about that one? Sure. Um, you know, bad apples, I keep hearing that in this, this narrative and, you know, and I agree with some of the things that I hear that we're, we're really a profession that can't have bad apples. Um, and we can't just brush it off as a bad apple. Yep. So if we do have an officer that is not following policy, and violating use of force policy, or, or whatever it might be, um, we need to take action. And um, when those do come to our level, or even the or any level, really, any officer has that duty to intervene, to report, and that per policy to, to let us know when stuff is going on. Um, and we take those seriously. There will be an investigation, as the chief had talked for uh, internal affairs, IA investigation into the conduct. Uh, we will review body-worn camera, dashboard camera from our patrol cars, Witness statements from those around. If people have video that they took of themselves with their cell phones, we will look, examine that, <clears throat> and uh, and then we'll do an evaluation of the incident, or it, multiple if it is that. Um, and generally, that that will go all the way up to the chief of police where that review would be happen. And again, the city attorney would help us with now those decisions. Aren't really made in a bubble. There's a a lot of people coming together and really evaluating the situation and then whether or not we need to, is it a training issue that, that we just need to retrain the officer or is it so severe that we're actually looking at criminal charges against an officer and then terminating the officer. So this and everything in between, right? I guess in a nutshell. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, you know, something, they, you know, as you were talking about this too, um, as far as looking within and earlier, you know, I talked about, uh, well, I talked about a lot of stuff tonight, <laughs> but let me say this. It is not easy to be a police officer. Um, and this is obviously not the first time our profession has been uh, held to answer for the actions of some of our members. That is appropriate. At the end of the day, we are public servants. Um, but let me talk about the other side of that too. So one, absolutely. The most important thing, we cannot be using excessive force. Absolutely. But here's the other side of that coin. Something that we can't tolerate is what we in the business we'd call making right turns all night long. I'm not going to have members of my department not enforcing the law just because people on a national narrative are tired of cops. Real crime happens in this town. We've already had more shootings in 2020 than we did in all of 2019. And it's barely September. I know it's, feel, it's felt like a long year, longest year ever, but still, I can't afford to pay someone their salary if they aren't going to be helping me reduce crime here in Woodland. That's why community policing is important. Uh, I encourage everybody, just Google community policing. What is it? Uh, it's us working with the community. It's us working with the schools, with the downtown business owners, with the other agencies like mental health, like the DA's office, with YOLO Conflict Resolution Center, working with people. Because see, when I got into being a cop, it was law enforcement did whatever it was gonna do. And then we didn't talk with the others on problem solving. Nowadays, our philosophy is the exact opposite. When a problem comes in, we, are, we want to find who else can share in this problem? Who else can help us fix this? Prime example, is 
Robin's issue earlier, right? We've got a neighborhood complaint, probably drug sales. Um, who knows what else in that neighborhood? It can't be solved anymore just through traditional law enforcement. Look, we've already arrested three different people for cause for doing at least two shootings each this year in 2020. They get released. California voters have changed the the sentencing guidelines, the laws. It's we can't solve problems the way we used to. That's again why we need critical thinkers as part of the department and why we got to find non-traditional solutions to some of those same old problems that we've been having for a long time. Okay, can you quickly, two, three minutes, talk about, because normally a part of this discussion is uh, militarization. We did get a question on the demilitarization. Can you speak quickly on that do that quick. So the question was uh, real quick, do we have a SWAT team? Quick answer is yes. Um, how often is it used? About six times a year. And do we need our own SWAT team? And it is not our own SWAT team. We're a regional SWAT team. We work with our partners in the county. Villa County Sheriff's Department is our direct partner, but we also work with the Sacramento Police Department and Davis Police Department. So um, there are incidents in town that require a, a higher response, high risk warrants, um, looking for a homicide suspect, something like that that the ones that we have arrested. Yep. So that's the need for it real quick. Do we have an MRAP or an armored vehicle from the military? And do we have policies regarding its use? Quick answer is yes, we did get an armored vehicle from the military. And um, it is, it's needed uh, for a couple of reasons. And, and we do have policies regarding its use. When we look at it in, in a tactical situation or SWAT, it's usually because we're going to an active shooter or hostage situation, someone with firearms, and we need the protection to protect our officers going in. And we're gonna hopefully get people out, victims out, neighbors out, and we're gonna use that vehicle to do just that to protect the people that are inside. Um, when it came time to replace our old one that we had, and it was, mm -hmm. you could see through the floorboard, it was sold. Uh, it was at about a cost of about $450,000 to buy a civilian one. The military offered this one to us for free. So it was, and it met our needs, and that was important. Because um, the other need we use it for, it's a very high vehicle, it's all terrain. We know that we could have floods in Woodland, and it can forge the waters that we might need to get through. Since we do work with our county partners, it can go to the hills of Rumsey, because we've taken it up there into the county for whatever rescue operation we need to do. So uh, that answers those questions there, I think, on demilitarization. Yeah. And, and we're not just making this stuff up. Just in Michigan earlier this year, there were two different departments. Uh, there was a dam failure in Michigan, and uh, two, two different departments used their armored vehicle, just like ours, to drive in and evacuate people in a flood situation. There was something like two feet of water, uh, running water. And, uh, and they were able to get in and get people safely evacuated. So it does have that purpose also. Okay, uh, out of respect for time, uh, I'm gonna start closing up. Uh, SRL Flores, anything else you wanna say this evening? No, just uh, thank you for being here and being a part of this. Yeah, Deputy Chief Cucci. It's like after that, I enjoyed the questions that we got. It's a good discussion and uh, I look forward to having more of these. Okay, this is the, going to be the first of many, and I want to learn from this. So, uh, as I mentioned before, the email address is going to stay active. Um, I know a lot of people also have my email address. I'd love your comments, uh, one, on what do we want to talk about next? What else do we need to dive deeper into? And then, two, give us some feedback on this format. Um, we, we don't know when uh, we're going to be meeting in person, you know, in large groups again, and we want to get better. Uh, so we're going to work on that. There's a number of people I need to thank for making tonight happen. Um, first, I want to take all, thank all the members of the city council. So I went and talked to them. Uh, I talked to the public safety subcommittee about our policies. 
Um, they gave me feedback and now we're here having this meeting. But all members of the council were absolutely supportive of this dialogue and increased transparency and the police department being open to change. They're a great resource, use them. Um, I also wanna take uh, thank our computer folks. So the members of our information systems here in the city, uh, there's a gentleman, Jay, he has made all this happen tonight. Uh, he is here tonight working behind the scenes. Um, and he, this is the first time we've ever done a meeting at the same time in English and in Spanish on a Zoom platform and on wave broadband. And Jay made all that happen. Of course, with the support of Jack and Scott from our IT department. And then I couldn't get my message across this eloquently in Spanish without our interpreters, Carol and Samuel. You are a vital part of this meeting and I really appreciate you helping us connect with our Spanish speaking population. I also wanna thank Wave Broadband. They gave us two channels tonight, channel 20 for English, channel 21 to transmit in Spanish. I wanna thank certainly these two, but all of my officers and staff. I'm proud to work with each of you. I trust each of my officers and everybody on my staff. And if I didn't, you'd be uh, under investigation right now. So the fact that you're not means that I trust you. And I wanna thank the city manager. Um, I can only imagine what it was like when uh, this proposal came up of, hey, let's get the police chief out there and let him have just an open community meeting to talk about use of force, uh, changes in the police department, that level of trust that he would allow us to have this conversation with as many people in the community as wanted to be a part of it tonight um, was fantastic. So I appreciate his support uh, and his leadership in all this. So with that, I'm gonna uh, encourage you all to uh, send us feedback. We will again be promoting our next one, probably in that November, December time range. Um, we are gonna continue modifying policies in between now and then, and we're gonna keep improving on this format. With that, I wish you and your families all the best. Keep those victims of the fires in your thoughts and prayers and be safe. Good night, everyone.